Hello and welcome to part two of my playthrough of GMT's Tripack Battles of the American Revolution, specifically Utah Springs. We left it where we had the Brits in their encampment blissfully unaware that the Americans were trundling up the road here, ready to engage the poor foraging party, who, if you remember, uh, decide, the fate of the foraging party decides who gets the initiative in turn three. Right, let's have a look. It's turn two. So we move the counter down one, and the first part of the sequence of play again says initiative segment, which we don't do because it's purely the American's turn. So we're now in the movement phase, and the first part of that is place reinforcements. So we'll place them on point A, X A, and we'll have a little look what that stack's made up of. Here's the stack. We've got a couple of militia. Uh, we've got our first artillery unit and our first leader, Wade Hampton. So let's get those put together. And get ready for the next part of the movement phase, which is, is of course, the movement. Now it looks like we're going to have a bit of combat um, this turn against the foraging, the poor foraging party. Uh, but so first a little word about zones of control, which you may have heard of. If you're not aware, zones of control are the six hexes that surround the unit. Potentially. In this case, the foraging party have five zones of control because they can see into these hexes, but there's some forest here and they cannot see into that, so they do not exert a zone of control. You can exert a zone of control out, but not into. So these five are the foraging party's zones of control, so it's something you've got to be aware of all the time. We can also, this turn, use strategic movement, which, as I said in the previous video, means along a road you can move double your movement allowance, but you mustn't end up adjacent to an enemy unit. Indeed, you can't start next to an enemy unit, but that's not going to apply here. So, let's move. I'm going to move these horse round here, I think, so I don't enter the zone of control. They can move six. One two, three, four, and they've got to stop. And the same with this one. One, two, three, four. Remember, we have to move them singularly because of the stacking rule. And then we'll move up. Let's have a look here. First. Militia. Hmm. I think what I'll do, I'll have the North Carolina militia babysit, as it were, the artillery. So we'll move this up. One, two, three. Can't move any more because I will end up next to the um, enemy unit using strategic movement. And now we'll move our leader. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we'll move Lee's Legion. One, two, three, and stop. And Palmetto Foot. One, two, three, oops, and stop. Last thing to move is the uh, artillery. And we can use strategic movement for those. One, two, three, and looking after them, one, two, three. Okay, that, if I've played it correctly, is the end of the movement phase. Next phase is the rally phase, there's nobody to rally. Defensive artillery phase, so none of that, no rifle phase. We haven't got any rifles yet. Close combat phase, here we go. 
it's time to decide the fate of the poor foraging party. So let's just move around a bit. Now, in close combat, all friendly units have to attack the enemy units they are adjacent to. So I can't just attack with this one, I have to attack with all these and all these because they're both adjacent. So the first thing we do is work out the uh, ratios. Here we go, maths. So what have we got? We look at the strength points and total them up. We've got three here and one, two, three, four, five there. The foraging party have one, you can see it's in brackets, and actually their movement allowances in brackets as well. This tells you or reminds you that the foraging party cannot actually attack, can only defend, and uh, their movement, they can only retreat, withdraw, they can't advance. So that's there just to remind you. They have a morale of minus one as well. So it's five to one. Now, it only goes up to four to one. So that's what we'll be using, five to one. A uh, four to one, big you put. So let's put four to one. Now, I think I mentioned it in the video, but this surprise attack rule that the Americans get doesn't apply to the foraging party. because it's, it's got to be the first sort of proper combat unit. Four to one. Right, the next thing we have to do is pick a lead unit. Now the lead unit advances into the hex if the unit, the enemy unit, is either destroyed or withdraws. Also, uh, anything bad happens will happen to the lead units as well. So who are we going to have as our lead unit? I think we'll have Lee's Legion because the next thing we do is add on the unit morale of the attacker's lead unit. And as you can see, it is plus one. If I can pick it up, plus one. So that gets added as a DRM, dice roll modifier, plus one. If there are any leaders adjacent to the attacking units, their um, attacking DRM or combat DRM can be added as well. In this case, it's Hampton. You can see he's got a one, but he's not adjacent, so we can't add it. Then on the combat, close combat DRMs, I don't know if we can come in. There we are. These are all cumulative. You have to look down and see if any of these apply. And then when we do the defender, you do the same for them. So let's have a look. We've done the attacker's lead unit. Oh, the thing is we have to adjust the um, attacker's morale um, in case it's plus one. And uh, we have to look at the army morale, but as it's the first turn, the army morale of both sides is high. So if we look along, it says unit morale, normal. So there's no adjustments. It only gets worse is if the morale drops and you have to take uh, take it off the lead unit morale, but we're okay. Plus one. Uh, any defending unit is a rifle unit? No. Any defending unit is disrupted or shattered? No. Blah, blah, blah. No, none of those apply. So we now do the defender. The defender, we add, or look at its morale, and it's minus one. So that's got to be an advantage to the attackers. So they actually get another plus one. Math, say. Eh? We look down their defenders' benefits and we see, yeah, they don't get anything at all. The last thing we do is do the old tactics using our sheet that I showed you earlier on. So I'll just read it. We're going to do it for the Americans first. Engaging without a leader. Well, they are actually leaders behind Hampton. So, is withdraw plausible? Can the Americans withdraw in case it all goes pear-shaped? Yes, they can. Withdraw here or into the woods or forest there. So, yes. So, it says use table one. 
And there we are. There's table one. And it says use a D8. So I'll just get the old uh, tower there and we throw a D8 and we'll see what we get. We get a four and a four on that table is stand fast, which sort of makes sense. I'm just gonna make a note because I forget. Now we do the same for the poor defenders. Engage without a leader, yes. Is withdraw plausible? Well, technically speaking, they cannot withdraw here because these units are exerting zones of control themselves. And even though this is a shared zone of control, this one is uh, the horse zone of control. So they can't withdraw there, but they could withdraw into the, uh, into the forest. So they can withdraw. Again, table one, a D8. Let's see what the poor foragers get. They get a, ooh, a seven. And that is skirmish. So now we look up and cross-reference on the on this table here. And I shall do that. It's uh, stand fast for the attackers and skirmish. Ah, uh, unfortunately, that ends up as another plus one. Oh dear. Right, everything's done. We can now throw the die for the combat. And just a, a note here, normally a zero on this uh, die means 10. In this game, it's actually zero. So we've got to remember that because you're going to autopilot. So we are going to have a look up on the four to one. We get a plus three. Let's see what happens to the foraging party. Oh, that's an eight. An eight plus three, is 11. Oh, crikey. Here we are. Four to one. 11. And we look on and see what that two means. And the two means a two step loss. Now, do you remember um, on the other side of some of the counters, there are reduced uh, abilities. A two step loss, though, would be an eliminate because you turn it over, one step loss, can't turn it over again. It's eliminated, but the foraging party have nothing on the back. They are, of course, eliminated. Bit uh, one-sided, but there we go. Sometimes, sometimes though, if you're lucky with the die throw and all that sort of thing, they can withdraw. So that's the end of the combat. The lead unit has to move in. I can move in any others that were involved in the combat. I think I'll move in those. I don't think there's any point. Or is there? No, I'll um, I'll leave those. I'll leave those there, I think. So that is it. That is the end of combat. And that is the end of the turn. So I'll get tidied up and we'll start turn three. Before we start turn three, I nearly forgot. Normally what happens is in some, well, in some combat results, you get morale, army morale adjustments. And if this was a normal unit, you see there, suffers a two result, the attackers will get plus one to their morale and the defenders will get minus two to their army morale. But again, doesn't apply to the uh, foraging party. Remember, their only purpose in life is to decide <laughs> Who has the initiative in turn three? Right, here we go. Turn three. Now you can see we've got a couple of stacks to put on. So, move that over to turn three. We'll take this stack and that goes on entry point A. And if you remember, Swamp Fox and the rifle unit on point B, up the top. And there we are. The uh, turn, as you can see now, is split into two for the two uh, 
sides. But there we go, Americans won the initiative on turn three. That's it, let's have a look what's in that stack. Here we are, so you can see we've got three uh, units of Continentals of SP3. We've got another artillery and the man himself, Nathaniel Green. Now remember me saying about stacking limits, six SPs, and you're thinking, well oh, crikey, you've got nine there, but you can have the stack as high as you want on the entry hex. It's only when it finishes its movement does the um, stacking limit apply. So there we are. The next part of the movement phase is, of course, the movement bit. So rather than uh, you uh, watch me twiddle my thumbs and ponder what to move, I shall do the move and uh, come straight back. So remember, we've got these down here which are going to move and old Swampy up there with the uh, rifle unit. So, see you in a bit. Right, that's the movement. What I've done is I've moved the horse units down here. What I'm thinking, of course, is maybe so we can get flanking around here or maybe up through here. It depends. We've got this swamp in the way, though. So we'll see what happens. Let's see what the Brits do. And just move, generally moved everything up. There's uh, green with a full stack. I've got uh, one of the artillery there under the protection of Lee's Legion foot. Moved up Hampton. And that's about it, really. Using strategic movement as well, where, wherever I could. The only uh, units I haven't moved are those right up the top. Swamp Fox and that rifle unit. So let's have a look at those. Right, here's Swamp Fox and this South Carolina militia rifles. Now I have in my hot little hand the uh, terrain effects chart because uh, something a little bit different here. We've got to get across this river and up a slope. I'm not sure we've got enough movement points for that. So let's have a go. Um, I'm going to move the these are got a movement of four. I'm going to use strategic movement. One and a half. hope this is right. Now I need to get across the ferry. And according to the terrain's effects chart, that's going to cost me two movement. So one and a half, two, three and a half. So we're across the other side. We're on this side of the, the hex now. Oops. So, to get up that slope costs another movement point plus getting into a clear hex, which is another movement point. So, we haven't got enough. We have to stop there. Could be a bit dodgy. So, that's the rifle's movement. And Swamp Fox could come across the river, but I don't want to split them up. I want to see what the, uh, what the Brits are going to be doing down in the encampment. So again, one and a half, two, three and a half. So I'll put them, they're both across the, uh, the Santee River now, but they've got to get up that slope. But, but that'll have to wait until next turn. That is the Americans' turn over. It is now, at long last, the Brits, the Brits' turn, so We'll turn the uh, counter over and put it on the turn track. It's now time for the Brits to move. Okay, it's the Brits' turn now because the Americans finished their movement. There wasn't any uh, defensive artillery fire from the Brits, no rifle fire yet. So, the first part of the Brits' turn is the uh, movement phase. Place reinforcements, we haven't got any, so we're just on to the move part. So let's see what we're going to do. Once again, I'll have a think, and then I'll come back and show you how I moved. Right, I've made my moves for the British. Remember, uh, tactics, I'm learning as I'm going along, just as I am the rules. So uh, let's see how it progresses. 
So, what have I done? Basically, I've left Stuart in the headquarters with the grenadiers just because in case Swampy here breaks through we've got somebody to defend this hex. Remember this is the victory hex for the, uh, for the Americans. I've sent up the rifle unit and the New York volunteers but because of uh, having to cross the, the creek and all that, that's as far as I could get. I've moved everybody else up, but March Banks I've left there. He's a, uh, to, to form a defence, but he's also under orders to keep an eye on the right flank in case, again, Swamp, Fox and the rifle unit break through. I've also got the artillery here, and we've actually got a clear line of sight so if the Americans move up which I'm sure they will they'll be in range it's three hexes remember for um, artillery we may be able to uh, use our unleash our cannons on them so we'll see how we go so whoop pop that on there apart from that the other chap I've moved here because um, I'm a little bit worried about these Horse, oh, horse units here, so in case they try and break through, I want a unit that can either sort of move here or down here. So, we'll see how we go. That's it. The next uh, part is defensive artillery phase. Well, the uh, Americans are too far back for their cannon. Rifle phase, well, maybe next turn, but not, not yet. Close combat? No. But I think that's going to happen as well next turn. And that's it. That is a sort of manoeuvring turn. The Americans are advancing up. The Brits are forming a defence. And next turn I think it'll all start to, uh, start to kick off. So, I think we'll leave it there. Ready for turn four. And this is the first turn where we'll throw for initiative. So you see how that happens and uh, we'll take it from there. So I hope you've enjoyed it. This is, uh, this is great fun to play this game. I, I th I'm thoroughly enjoying this uh, game, which is GMT's Tri-Pack Battles of the American Revolution. And in this case, Utah Springs. If you have enjoyed it, please, as always, consider, if you haven't already, subscribing and pushing the like thing and the bell and leaving comments if you wish. It does help. And uh, thank you, as always, to my subscribers. Well, this has been part two of a playthrough of Utah Springs, and we'll see you in the next one. Until then, you take care and goodbye.